Welcome to Faster Together 2018. I am Sam Messman. This is going to be fun. Um, so we're going to start off with a brief discussion, and then we're going to bring out the jello and the mud and start a wrestling match here because we're talking about something that makes everyone angry, uh, which is which NLE do you use and why? And so there's going to be a lot of anger and tantrums. Um, no, actually, what we're going to really try and do is get some informed um, discussion and a conversation from uh, four working editors, all from different backgrounds, who are doing amazing things, and they're going to talk about what they do and why. So before we get started, let's go ahead and quickly go up and down uh, the panel, and you guys can introduce yourselves. I want to know what you guys work on, what tools do you use, and what inspires you. Um, my name is Monica Daniel. I've been in the business for about 14 or 15 years. And uh, the first about 10 or 11 years of my career, I was working on non-union uh, network television shows in Los Angeles. Um, game shows, clip shows, documentaries, um, uh, short packages for live event coverage, all sorts of stuff. And in the last three years, I made the move over to scripted television as an assistant editor and the last thing I worked on was Altered Carbon for Netflix. And all of those, uh, all of that work, with the exception of two independent documentaries that were cut in Final Cut 7, was done in Avid Media Composer. My name is Scott Simmons. I work out of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, so it's a different type of market where we've got a little bit of everything except, you know, TV shows and, and movies. So I work on a lot of corporate, a lot of music stuff, a lot of... Uh, commercials, a lot of multicam, a lot of music video things. I I work in whatever because I'm a freelancer, so I don't want to turn down a job because I don't know how to use the tool. So I'm happy to work in anything. I've so far this year, I've done jobs in Final Cut Premiere and uh, Media Composer, and sometimes it's one week I'm in one, then another week I'm in another, or maybe tomorrow I'm in another, or later in the day when I got to make changes, I'm in another, and. Yeah, and then sometimes I get bored with one, I want to use another one. My name is Vince Michelli. Uh, I'm actually a producer-director with a background in editing. I run a production company called Lone Suspect, and we do feature films and uh, TV shows, and we've done a bunch of stuff for Funny or Die. And uh, I've been in LA for about 15 years and edited for about 10 of that. So um, I did a lot of, a lot of unscripted TV uh, Nat Geo, Discovery Channel, stuff like that, um, and kind of bounced around as well. Did a lot of Final Cut 7, did a lot of Media Composer, and then personally, I've done, you know, I've cut, I finished a feature in Premiere uh, a couple months ago, and did a TV pilot in, fi in Final Cut 10, so I'm kind of all over the place. Hello, my name is Tony Gallardo, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas, so not too far from Nashville, and uh, I've been doing this for about maybe 15 plus years, 17 years, editing, directing. Um, I have a company, and we do a lot of basically like advertisements, so commercials, short promo stuff, that type of thing, so stuff that lives on the web and gets broadcast. And um, I'm, we have a Final Cut 10 house, so we have another editor, uh, and we bring in freelance editors. And we also can use a Media Composer as well, um, uh, and we also use Resolve, so I'll cut sometimes in, in Resolve, and that's pretty much it. All right, and just to give you guys a heads up, um, you know, feel free to build off each other's points. Like this can be a conversation. It doesn't, you know, so it's, you can add to something that people say and and et cetera, and it can be a little bit uh, informal. But you know, I guess to to kick things off, um, what would you guys say is the currently the biggest issue that's affecting the industry for editors and post production at the moment? You have to do more and more as an editor. Things that. Uh, I mean, on the higher end productions, you know, they have everything specialized in, in individual departments. But I know people who, you know, have, have their own businesses um, or just like on lower budgeted TV shows, you know, you're asked to do the finishing. Uh, when I was working at E, I was the offline and online editor and I did everything a media composer where I was mastering the show, I was color correcting. After I was done cutting the show, we would be doing all of the lower third titles and adding the graphics in. That was that was stuff we all had to do. You needed Resolve. <laughs> the resolve was not uh, ready at that time. But I think, you know, people, 
clients expecting more for the same price or less, I think is a big issue because the tools are capable of it. So they're, they just expect that, oh, then that's the same thing, right? It's like, no, no, that's additional charge. It's a la carte. And how do you manage that before we go in? Like, how do you um, manage those well, expectations? I'm, I'm kind of in my own little bubble. You know, I'm working on union shows. So there are strict contract regulations and rules in place to protect that. Um, sure on the shows I'm on. We, on the independent side, right? We have to, yeah, exactly. I have to deal with that all the time where it's, like you said, oh, now uh, can you, you can just deliver that to Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and make all the different versions of that 30 second spot. It's just a one quick time it's movie, just, right? You can do it by, <laughs> right after lunch, right? And it's like, no, that's going to take time. We need to reframe. So that is something that for me has been a way I need to educate my clients and let them know, like, listen, guys, I have no problem doing what, what you want, but maybe is there room in the budget? Let's start thinking about adding some budget to this so that way we can get this done for you uh, ahead of time. And don't ask me like, you know, yesterday for delivery tomorrow, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, we have to deal with that a lot. Another problem is that with the readily, readily available tools everywhere, a lot of clients kind of know what they do, even though they don't do yeah. it very well. Some of them may edit on their own a little bit, or they may just surf the internet enough to know that, wait, I want to do this thing. Why can't you just do that thing? Right. You know, why can't you mix the audio in there? You've got the Adobe Creative Cloud. You can do whatever. And, and you have to deal with trying to educate them on what some of these things can and can't do. Besides the fact, there are things that I can't do, nor do I want to do. I can try. It may suck. But, I, you know, what, is that what you want? You want it to suck? If you want it to suck, I'll do it. You know, and that, that, type, that type of thing. And, and, and they just don't, they think that anybody can do anything because it's a click of a software and a download and off you go. And yeah. sometimes a preset. Yeah, and I've had just on like random little side projects I've done, you know, they'd ask, oh, can you do like the sound mixing too? I'm like, I could do a rough sound mix for approval review screenings. Yeah. They're like, oh, you can't just do like a mix and make it sound good. I was like, no, you need someone who specializes yeah. in sound for that. Yeah, so, I, I think there's pluses and minuses to that because, uh, you know, as an editor, I always wanted to present the best possible work to executive producers. So I would never be in a situation where I would actually have to color correct and finish when I was doing stuff for like Nat Geo or whatever. Um, but I would do, I would send, you know, the sound guys and the music, we would do the music, but uh, sound mixing and color would be, they would get something that's almost completely done by the time I was done with it. Cause I wanted less notes from the executives. So if you present something that looks great and, and is roughly mixed, then, you know, uh, executives had to have a tendency to give you less notes. So that was sort of my, my approach to it. So I guess there's so, you know, positives with it as well. So I want to know who has this myth mythical workflow where everyone gets these expectations uh, that this can all be done immediately. Like, where does that, that idea get created where the producers and, and, clients turn around and say like because it does it didn't happen on the previous job because nobody knows anybody who's actually delivering it this way so where does that conversation point start where it then gets handed to us to go and have to defend what we do when this was never agreed on i think it begins often in their heads because if you have a job that you do that you're i'm doing a a, a corporate spot or or even a 30 second spot and someone is on Facebook and they're scrolling through and they see this autoplay video that like, wait, that's my competitor that's bought advertising there. We don't have a Facebook video, but we just did this video. So then they ask, can you also do a Facebook video? And, and you know, it's a different sort of medium. So you have to think about what, what is right on Facebook or on, on any, pla any platform or any place where it goes. But since they see it so readily everywhere, it's just an, ap it's an afterthought to a lot of clients to say that, oh, well, I need this too. We did this. So why can't we do that? And I, don't, I think often they don't mean to, they're not trying to screw us out of and get free work. It's just, it's just, I just think they it. don't understand yeah. the whole process and what goes into it. And, it. and it's part of that relationship too, of building with them and saying, hey, let's, let's think about this. Let's make sure we do this the right way for you. So that way you're executing and delivering when you need to, um, for your product and just having that relationship to educate them and say, this is how we should do it. Let's, going forward, let's do this. And that, that's helped me a lot. And it's I, also, also helpful to just set those expectations up yeah. front. Oh, yes. Like I always, you know, when I take on clients, I like to just, you know, 
my business partner gets annoyed with me sometimes, but I like to spell everything out before we start just so there are no surprises. Like, oh, I thought we we're also going to do this because everyone else does that. You know, I like to, yeah. I like to just get it on paper. This is what we're doing that way. Usually there's that kind of avoids a lot of the surprises. And I think, unfortunately, it's just because it's so competitive out there that, you know, we see posts on Facebook all the time in the, the user groups about people are trying to, you know, undercut everyone else who's trying to make a living. So they'll, they'll do a lot more for cheaper because the programs are so accessible. So it's very easy to put them on your laptop and get access to them. And so they're just saying, well, I could do all this for this amount. It's like, well, you get what you pay for. Yeah. And then, you know, I hear stories. I think you've told me stories, Scott, of you're like, and then they end up paying you a lot more to do a fixer upper job. Sometimes totally. And there are times when you have to say, okay, you're, you're right. You probably can get it done cheaper somewhere else. Enjoy. Take it. I'm, I'm happy for you to, to, you know, to go do that. And, and I think you know, good clients that you have relationships with won't do that. But you often get some that maybe they really don't have any money for something or they have very little bit of money and you have to weigh that, okay, is it worth me doing it for a little money for this relationship or just let them take it away? Well, I mean, I think this is something that, you know, we all feel like, and, and so I think probably what people watching this might be curious about is like, what is one specific thing each of you guys do to sort of separate yourselves and sort of develop that long-term client relationship where you can kind of stay above the fray in some of these things? What's the strategy that maybe somebody can apply to their career where um, you know they can separate themselves a little bit. I have a tendency to underpromise and overdeliver when I have a client that I'm cutting a project for. That's sort of a way that I, you know, I'll come in and kind of talk to them about you know about a project, and they'll ask me for certain things that they want to do, and um, you know I'll I'll tell them what I can do and then know that I can exceed that expectation and usually first round of notes or whatever comes in and they're ecstatic. And that's, that's a, a, a trick I've used with a lot of clients and it seems to work pretty well. As opposed to overselling them to get the, get the job and then turning in something that's less than desirable. I personally tend to be very accommodating. I don't necessarily fear a job that looks like a train wreck. You know, if it, if it, if it looks like a train wreck, sounds like a train wreck, train wreck smells like a train wreck it's probably a train wreck but i don't mind a train wreck because in this day and age it's pretty with the state of the nles as they are now it's, it's pretty easy to to fix a train wreck yeah it's not fun sometimes and, and it may be you know a pain in the butt and you have to weigh your budget and what you're charging what you're being paid versus how big the train wreck is but i i think i try to be very accommodating to that type of thing and and you know, not make the client feel bad that it is a train wreck, but it's like, you know what? Yeah, it's, there's problems here, but there's, we, we can fix it. And if we can't fix it, if I can't fix it, we'll find somebody that can. And, and, and unless we determine it is unfixable, and that's a whole other bridge to cross. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on these shows. You know, I don't have my own business where I'm, my clients are my editors, my producers, my showrunners. And even when I was editing, you know, I was still trying to like see what I could do for the producers. But I think assuring them that you do have their best interests at heart, even when they're being completely unreasonable with the expectations, it's that whole, you know, the politics of dealing with them. Like, uh, for example, I mean, I, I use Media Composer for everything and I <clears throat> can do, you know, really, I'd like to think, say pretty decent effects work and media composer, and a lot of times people are like, why aren't you doing that in After Effects? I'm like, because they're not paying me to use After Effects. I am letting them know. They are paying me to use this software at their offices. They're providing it, and I do the best work I can in that <coughs> software. And I set realistic expert expectations of like, okay, here are the limitations. If you want more than this of what I can do, what you're paying me to do, you know, you need to outsource that to like a graphics person or, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, I just set those expectations, but I assure them, you know, I'm going to do the best I can with what, you know, you are paying me for. And then we could work out. So, you know, I don't lie to them, but I do. It's like I try to say, OK, let's see what we can do to accomplish your goals. And that's just, you know, client relations, really. Yeah, it's kind of a. A little bit of everything for me, you know, as a business owner to keep a relationship with a client, to always be with them, have the, give them that reassurance that they need. Um, but 
for me, just becoming a creative solution for them. You know, hey, let's let's talk more in advance in the creative stages, and so that way maybe we can provide more services for you. How can we help you um, deliver this, or do you need help finding? you know, music or original music. So that has opened up a lot of doors for me, just becoming a, like more of a creative service for them. So, hey, can you also provide this? I can help you find that. And so that's been kind of nice. And so let's shift uh, our attention a little bit now to the to the tech around this, because I think in a, little, in a way it's a little bit like the Wild West at the moment, because mm -hmm. all of these different NLEs have strengths and weaknesses. And one tool may be great for one thing, but then you're gonna find something that is kind of a deal breaker when it comes to a specific workflow and vice versa. And I'm sort of curious um, where each of you, based, because you're all kind of in different spheres, see um, this the current tool set winning and losing in your own worlds and, and why. Final Cut 10 is amazing. Uh, <laughs> No, it, uh, for me, it is, I mean, there's no way I could do, have my business without it because I need to do as much as I can inside the NLE motion graphics and spit things out um, with quality as well. And so I found that when I switched to Final Cut 10, um, I noticed that I stopped going to After Effects as much just because I can start to do those things that I was going to After Effects before right inside my NLE. And the ability to make changes faster for my clients or have my assistants make changes um, faster is needed and you know budgets are shrinking the schedules are shrinking and yes you can combat that and you can talk and plan through that stuff but the reality is that they are shrinking so it has definitely helped us to be able to do a lot of those, those graphics those promos right inside um, inside of Final Cut so that's been helpful a lot for us uh, I've got an edit bay at my <clears throat> in my office that has Resolve installed on it Premiere installed on it Media Composer installed on it and Final Cut 10 installed on it and a lot of the projects that we do, um, you know, whether it's a feature film with one editor and an assistant editor or a TV pilot with one editor or sketch stuff with one editor, it doesn't really matter what NLE we use because they all can get the job done. Um, it really depends on the editor who wants to come in and what their, what their preference is. Or so how do you make that decision which one you're going <clears> to <throat> grab for which job? It's usually, you know, like our last feature film that we did that I, that I produced, um, we, the editor wanted to cut on Premiere. And I was a little hesitant because my back, well, most of my background has been Media Composer. And I cut my last feature in Media Composer. And I know how reliable it is. And, and so he cut it in Premiere and we had no issues. And then I finished the film on my system in Premiere and had zero issues and thought, wow, okay, I can cut a feature in Premiere and it's almost identical to Media Composer. Um, now, when you get into bigger scale TV work, when you've got six or seven editors and multiple assistant editors and you've got producers who've got, who need to have access to footage and log footage, uh, I think that's where, it's me where Media Composer still sort of edges out the competition because you know, project sharing and grouping is still, it's, it's changing. I just was at the Adobe booth and they're, they're constantly implementing new features, which is making me consider Premiere for bigger stuff. But, but I think Media Composer still sort of has the edge on some of that, the higher end features. <sighs> you know, I don't know. It's just, well, I think it depends on, I think a lot of it's market-based. In, in my yeah. market, in, in, in Nashville, it's kind of become a, it was Final Cut 7 heavy, you know, when Final Cut 7 is its heyday, and it's really turned into a premier town. For the, for the most part, there are, are facilities that still are Avid, uh, CMT's there, it's on Avid. Um, and there are some pockets of Final Cut 10 for production companies that, that like it. And I, I think that, for me personally, it uh, if it's not picked by the client, I will look at the project and decide, you know, what is in my mind, best for it. And Premiere, in this current iteration with the Creative Cloud, has a little bit of everything. It does everything, you know, really well. And, um, but organizational stuff that's really heavy on, on organization, and, you know, it's kind of hard to beat Final Cut Ten's way of doing things. Um, but then there's the idea of if you need something reliable or if you're working on a big show, I've done a couple of reality shows, uh, Media Composer was the choice there because you, you know, no one's ever been gotten in trouble for picking Media Composer because it's going to get the job done and get it done reliably. Maybe a little bit slower, um, 
you know, that, 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 that slow is not always a bad thing, but sometimes it's a bad thing. I see Monica wincing over there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of the diplomatic I'm answer, I'm but it's for my turn. <laughs> it's, uh, well, what, but you know, I mean, the Wild West is now resolved because uh, Black Magic is not going to suddenly decide. You know what? We don't. We don't want this to be a top-notch editor that everybody's using for editorial. They're just going to keep doing more and more and more, and I don't know what's going to happen with with that. Um, so uh, I like to think of myself as NLE agnostic. Every time that. Uh, uh, to use nice words, silly debate comes up on the boards. I'm just like, rolling my eyes so hard. I'm like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, you know, I think people should use whatever's best for them. Uh, I, I, those, the content I work on, you know, and I'm not working from home or from my own office. I'm working in their facilities. And there's an in infrastructure built around Avid Media Composer. I love Avid Media Composer. It's very, very powerful. I do see some of its weaknesses that the other Nellies have on it. Saying that, uh, um, you know, for you know smaller things, um, I have the Creative Cloud too. I'll use Premiere. And um, if someone hires me on a job where they're paying me to use Final Cut 10, I'll finally learn it. <laughs> but I mean, between you're gonna love it. <laughs> I opened it once, and then I closed it and said I'll come back to it later. There's always time. It's on my computer. No way. I put Final Cut 7 back on, and I didn't realize how to like hide it and to install both. I learned that after I had already uninstalled it. Um, you know, for between the two, uh, between Avid and Premiere, like those are my two go-tos for like the simpler projects where I don't need as much complex organization in the project. And maybe I'm just like popping in some random H.264s or multiple formats. You know, I'll just go to Premiere. It, it works really well, really fast with that. Um, I'm comfortable with the interface because um, I, I learned on Final Cut. And Final Cut 4, I think, was the first NLE I learned. And I have cut projects on set, uh, Final Cut 7. So that interface <laughs> is very comfortable to me. Um, I work on a lot of really complex projects where we have seven editors accessing the data, and we have complex bin organization that is vital, and we're moving bins back and forth and getting, you know, uh, stuff, media back from the online facility or sound, and so there's a set structure, and it, nothing beats Media Composer for those kind of complex workflows where we have multiple departments constantly feeding each other data, and so... Media Composer is great for those projects. And I know some people just like, oh, God, that's terrible. And I was like, OK, then don't use it. The sh the, the, what I'm getting paid to work on is Media Composer. So I'm going to use it as best I can. And it's, it's a really good tool. So I is Final Cut 10. So is Premiere. It depends on what you're working on and how you like to work. I think some people who poo-poo Media Composer they have poo-poo well, themselves. They, they've never seen <laughs> the complex workflow that goes into episodic television or feature film and how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours and bins. Or even and, just and reality all, shows. Yeah, reality shows even even worse. There's even more media there. Well, I think they, they, they've is... never seen what goes into that structure or that project that you're that you're dealing with. And you have it has to be reliable in those situations. Well I will say, and maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but uh, before NAB, you know, in terms of of updates, before NAB Premiere updated their software Adobe updated Premiere and Avid updated Media Composer. And if you look at the features between the two, Premiere just add, you know, they're still doing beta team collaboration stuff, which is cool that they're adding. Uh, they added a very professional time code window, which is really cool that they're targeting uh, professional editors. And Avid, this is no joke if you didn't know this, their latest update was where the splash screen which monitor it appears, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that was their update. That was the biggest feature was which side, of, which screen the splash screen updates on. Well, so in terms of well, not, which they had more than that. In uh, the, yeah, they had quite their, a bit more than that. But that was the that was in the latest release. That was like the featured thing of w what they fixed. Well, was, they had they have a bullet point list of all. I know, the things, but and that was one of the things. That was yes. one, but that was the thing that they were saying. This is the first thing we did, and to me, it's like, all right, well, 
which which companies are paying attention to what customers are asking for right now? Well, and here's I know maybe I, a way to reframe this discussion a little bit because you're dealing with high-end scripted workflows where there is an established workflow that happens. But on the flip side, I think what a lot of people often don't realize is that there's a wild west of, of content creation where you're getting all kinds of formats and resolution and media dumped on you. And how are you tracking and managing that that media? And what are you doing with metadata and, and all of these things to simplify some of the assistant edit work that happens? And I think a question is, if you're a kid kind of getting ready to enter in this industry and you're getting dumped all of this out on you because now we're getting endless amounts of video content coming in uh, and it's more and more and more. If you have, I mean, I think it's one thing where if you have a facility and you're doing a, a specifically scripted, that's a very established workflow. What do you guys, how do you approach projects that maybe have less structure to them? I add the structure because I will go insane if I don't do media management. And I think that's one of the strengths of Final Cut 10. It's like I said, I'm not as familiar with it, but I've heard it has fantastic metadata and tracking yeah. and just organization and you can find things so quickly and that's like a strength. It really has. Like it doesn't matter. It's the Wild West. If you are editing something, you need to be able to manage that media just because you're getting it doesn't because even on the high end, we get all kinds of formats and we're running that through a, um, our daily facilities deal with that management. But it has to happen. It still happens. It's just we're getting more support. And, you know, maybe for some of the other NLEs, uh, for someone who doesn't have, like, all these built-in departments, you know, the other NLEs will be better for that because they have to do it themselves. Part of it is that on these projects like you're talking about, people shoot themselves in the foot because they think because, you know, Premiere can edit any, any format in the world. They think, I can take any format in the world, throw it in Premiere, and start editing. But you still have to properly manage that stuff when it's coming in. And that may mean transcoding. That may mean making proxies. It may mean a lot of different things. You can't just throw it all in and expect it to go. You've never really been able to throw it all into Media Composer, even no. though the technology there lets you do it. It just It's not going to work. What Media Composer does is it forces you to adhere to media management. Um, whereas the other ones, they're a little more flexible. And so if you're not disciplined yourself in managing your media, I don't know how many times I've seen stories of like, oh, look, it's on someone's C drive. They have missing media yeah, from clients. It's like, how many times has that happened? And that's iTunes someone, folder. That's, that's someone who folder. hasn't managed their media because they're just like, oh, great, I could just put it in and start cutting. And it's like, no, no, yeah. no, no, there's so much more to that. It's a discipline. That is, a, that is the nice thing about Media Composer is it forces you, it's slower to get into it because it forces you to be organized and diligent with how you get your media in, organizing your project. But then when you're moving, you can move really quickly. I feel it's the same way for a Final Cut. 10, uh, you know, it'll take in anything, just like pretty much Premiere or Resolve will, but it really wants you to go by that, that metadata, keywording, and once you start doing that, uh, what you should be doing to begin with anyways, yes. uh, it really allows you to move fluidly. But I mean, if you do that in Resolve, uh, there's a lot of features in Resolve that are very similar to that as well. It's got tons of metadata features uh, that allow you to access and quickly s sift through media and reconstruct your bins pretty fast. That, I think it's I think it's a dark horse. All right, so now we're going to transition. We've got a couple. I've, Jeff, I think we're going to go a couple minutes over because there's a couple more things I want to hit. But um, basically, you know, I think um, it's clear that there is it, this is evolving quickly and things are moving very very quickly. Um, and I think as editors, we are being forced more and more to become more technical. Um, how do you guys personally manage the technical learning side of this with like the creative fun side that I think is a lot of why we got into the business in the first place? I actually love, love both sides of it. That's why when I was, you know, coming up, I was an offline and online editor. As the online editor, I was dealing with more the technical and the deliverables, the mastering and make sure stuff was broadcast safe. And I actually love both sides of it. I, it's, you know, cause sometimes you just get tired being creative and you just need a break. And, you know, I, I find the technical stuff fascinating because even knowing the technical stuff, it allows, if I have a understanding of the technical side, I could, it helps me get my work done faster, especially if I'm not waiting for someone else. Like if I don't know how to do an output or spit something out for someone, 
and I have to wait for someone to do it, or I could just spit it out myself. Yeah, if you're passionate, right? If you're passionate yeah. about being creative and, and working and delivering a good product, uh, a good story, whatever it may be, yeah. that it, technical side is going to creep up on you where you're going to realize, I need to learn this. I need to dig in, and that way I can be more efficient. That way I can open new possibilities. Yeah, I think it. it I don't think one takes away from the other. Um, I think some people just don't want to. They just, you know, they want to be the artists. And I was like, well, I, I like both. I... You know, I actually have, I don't go to film school. I have a science degree in psychology. I, I was doing science classes. So the technical aspects of it always really appealed to me, but I also wanted to do the creative side. So to me, they're very complimentary. And, you know, I've intentionally, that's why I was able to transition into scripted. So um, without, well, it wasn't easily, but, you know, they didn't have an issue hiring an editor as an assistant editor because I kept up on all my technical skills and was trying to build those. It and it just valuable. made me more valuable. I, I enjoy both sides too, technical and creative, but I, I have found that when I get hired to edit on a show, I'm not getting hired to be technical. I'm getting hired to be a creative, to be a storyteller. So that, that's, that's when I have to turn off the technical side and, and rely on assistant editors. And you know, could I go in and fix the group when it's broken in Avid? Sure but they're paying me to edit and I should be watching the footage and learning to tell a story. So I have to call up the assistant editor and say, hey, my, my group is, is broken or I need an output or whatever. So well, I don't know how many times when I was uh, editing and they're like, oh, something's broken. We have to, the assistants have to look at it. You know, the assistants couldn't figure it out. And I was like, hey guys, I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs on the <laughs> internet. Why don't I just go like, see what's going on? And I'd have the problems fixed within less than five minutes because I had more experience and knowledge than the assistants. And it's like, I am not above helping them if, because I'm, I'm losing time because I just, I was like, well, it's their job. It's like, well, if they don't know the answer, like maybe we need to brainstorm to, you know, try multiple things, see what's wrong. So I'm, I'm not above doing that. I think if you're working outside of, of, you know, a Hollywood sort of system and in, in, in the trenches, sometimes like, we are. Uh, you have to be technical. You have no choice. You have to know how to set your machines up. You have to know how to fix things when they when they mess up. You have to know how to deal with hard drives and the codecs and all that kind of stuff. And it's just a reality of doing production and post-production in this day and age. It's also part of the uh, client relationship, too. If they know that you are technically savvy, they may have a project that might be technical. And if you can assure them, hey, we can take care of this, we can weave in the creative with the technical um, that's also a big thing. But yeah, as a business owner, if something breaks down, I've got to fix it. And I think it's also valuable just, you know, as if you have your own business or whatnot, if you're hiring someone and they're completely BSing you, you need to be able to spot it because, you know, they're wasting your time. They're wasting your money. It could be jeopardizing your relationship with your client because they are completely BSing their way through the job. That's not okay. That's not cool. So this brings me to the final question, because unfortunately, we only have one time for one more. Uh, we're going to travel back in time for a little bit. If you guys could go back 20 years or however long back to when you were first getting started and you could tell yourself one piece of battle tested, hard earned advice that you maybe didn't know then that you wish you knew that could have saved you time, money and energy, what would it be? Think before I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't sweat the small stuff because it's not worth sweating over small, medium, and sometimes the large stuff. Don't get pissed off at your clients when they ask you to do stuff that you don't want to do when they hired you to do it. <laughs> uh, if you want to get somewhere, it's going to be you that's going to take you there. So don't, don't waste time. Get on that track and go. It's up to you. And I'll give mine too, which is uh, don't be intimidated because a lot of people... Um, will put themselves on pedestals and try and keep you in a certain place and you have to protect yourself and you have to remember why you got into the business and you have to be, you have to know your own value and um, make sure that you are always improving yourself because if you're not, no one will. Actually, uh, one thing I like to, cause I try to mentor a lot of people. And one thing I always tell them when they're in a tough decision is you are the only person who has your own best interests in mind. You have to, even, even someone who is like a great colleague and you're working with them, 
in the end, they're going to do what's best for them, not necessarily what's best for you. Not that they're trying to screw you over, but they're going to do what's best for them. So you have to do what's best for you. And if they're not complete asses, they will understand that. And to add to that too, it's also, don't be, find a mentor, find somebody in the industry who's, who's good, who could, you can lean on to, to get some advice from. Yeah. And someone who will be honest with you. Yeah, not that you have to follow it, but yeah, yeah. Just, it's just, hey, it's good to hear that bounce card. Sometimes you have an idea in your head, but then when you say it, it's different. So find a mentor as well. So I could do this for hours, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, guys, a big round of applause for our speakers here. So it was fun.